thankful to be talking with you. I think the first thing that I read of yours was your contribution to the five views on biblical inerrancy. And you know from my review, I appreciated that for many reasons, one of which is the humor. I've always enjoyed your use of humor in writing. And I'm curious, does that, are, do you have to think of these jokes or are, are you just writing and, and it just comes up naturally? Yeah, no, it comes up just quite naturally. I just uh, put things together. My sense of humor is quite, uh, to be honest, flippant, uh, which some people find uh, incongruent, inappropriate, and juvenile, and other people, other people find um, spontaneous, random, and very, uh, very, very refreshing. So yeah, my, my sense of humor is is very polarizing. Uh, li literally everywhere I go, uh, some people really like it's like Mike Bird, he's hilarious, or or well, Mike always oh, just a clown. He's just a clown, I tell you. Um, so it, I don't know. It, it just depends on your own predisposition, whether you what, and, and and what kind of humor you like or don't like. Right, right. Well, I, I'm in the refreshing camp. I anything that keeps me awake while I'm reading is is a good thing in the in the task. So. Yeah. But uh, yeah, maybe let's talk about Anglicanism for a moment. So we, we interacted just a little bit about a video I did on Ignatius yeah. a, a little bit back. And um, I'm curious, did you grow up as an Anglican or when did you become Anglican? Well, I didn't really grow up as a type of anything. I grew up in a very non-churched background and religion wasn't part of anything I did or Christianity. I think my, my uh, we had religious education, education in high school. And because we were from Britain, my mother sent me to the Church of England, which is basically the you know, the equivalent of having a little bit of uh, religious education, but not a fan. Uh, no, I came to faith during my time and when I joined the army, I got invited to a, a wonderful uh, Baptist church, a new church plant in, in, in Western Sydney. And it was terrific and it was, it was a lovely place. So I came to faith in the Baptist tradition uh, and I went to a Baptist seminary, uh, but later on, I, I went to Scotland, where you're really faced with like a smorgasbord of Presbyterianism, like, you know, six different ways of being Presbyterian, uh, that, that sort of thing. And I kind of, you know, did that for a while. And, and that, that was good for me. That, that did bring me to what I would call a more classically reformed view of church. Um, uh, and so, I mean, certain things I was able to go over, like infant baptism. So I kind of changed my mind on that. Now, around the same time, I was reading about a biblical scholar called F.F. F. Bruce, very famous uh, biblical scholar who was brethren. So very, very low church. And they didn't even have ordination. And he kept two books on his desk. One was a Greek New Testament. And the second thing was a book of common prayer. And I thought, well, you know, turned out pretty well for FFB. So I might have a crack at it too. <laughs> and I really enjoyed the, the prayer book. And I really, you know, the, uh, the, the prayers and the sort of the, the liturgy, uh, the, the, the rhythm of life or the rhythm to the year, I really enjoyed. And you were getting a regular diet of biblical um, readings, a regular diet of, of prayers and things like that. And I also noticed that when it came to being Anglican, like literally all the cool kids were doing it. C.S. Lewis, Alistair McGrath, uh, N.T. Wright, um, John Stott. Uh, there's a, there was a pretty, pretty, a very thick evangelical movement in Sydney, Australia, and some other colleges and people and places that were also Anglican. So when I moved back to Australia, I kind of hung around the Presbyterians for a while, and I've still got some really good friends there. Uh, in fact, I, I tend to joke that in Australia, I'm a bit like the Queen. South of the border, Queensland, I'm Anglican, but north of the border, I'm Presbyterian. So that's, that's, that's the Queen's deal in Scotland. She's Anglican in England, but she's Presbyterian in Scotland mm -hmm. to keep everyone happy. So yeah, I've, I've, I've kind of done, done it like that, but I've, I've moved down into uh, Ridley Colleges, which is a, a, an a Anglican evangelical college. And that's when I was able to kind of um, come out of the Anglican closet and truly identify as Anglican. I've you know gone through the process and, and attained holy orders. So I, I'm, a, I'm a priest in the Anglican Church of Australia. And I, I, love the, I love the Anglican tradition. Principally, the main thing I like about being Anglican is you get to be Protestant and Catholic at the same time, okay? So you do, so the Angl Anglicanism is a reformed church. And, and let me clarify a, um, a, uh, a misunderstanding. People think that Anglicanism is a, a via media between Catholicism and Protestantism. Let me say that is fundamentally not true. Anglican is a via media, but it's not between Rome and Westminster. It's a via media between um, um, 
Wittenberg and Geneva. It's a halfway house between two different ways of being reformed, between Lutheran and sort of, you know, dare we say, um, uh, Swiss or, or Calvinistic. That's the true meaning of via media. So Anglicanism is indeed a reformed church, but it values and treasures the wider Catholic tradition, the Catholic heritage of the church, because we, we want it to be a reform of the Latin Western church as it was in England. It's not creating a new church from scratch and saying, and all who came before us were thieves and robbers. And as my good friend, John Dixon would say, Anglicanism at its best, not at its worst, Anglicanism at its best is what the Roman Catholic Church would look like if it embraced the Reformation. Mm. You know, if it returned to its apostolic roots, if it really valued um, Catholicity based on the gospel rather than simply based on the magisterium. Mm. So that, that's, that in a nutshell is why I be Anglican. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. Well, it, it's interesting for me because I'm doing a lot of dialogue with Roman Catholics these days, and they often will say in the comments, you know, I could understand if you were an Anglican or maybe a Lutheran, but a Baptist. And uh, I, I understand that, you know, because I do recognize the Anglican tradition, which I have such admiration for, has this kind of historical reach, you know, in, in church government issues and, and that kind of thing. So I... I get it. I get the appeal. Um, and I, I'm noticing a lot of people from low church context moving into either sometimes Catholicism or Orthodoxy, but also Anglicanism. Are, are, do you see that? Oh, yeah, definitely. And uh, you, you can understand the reason why. Uh, I, you could argue that a lot of religion, this is true, I think, in, in the West, but I think it's particularly acute in America. Evangelicalism can be very consumerist. Mm -hmm. And it tends to be tied to key personalities, movements, networks. So you can have a church led by a very charismatic um, person with a neck, neck tattoo, not much, you know, seminary experience. And it's just good with people, good with ideas, very charismatic, very magnetic to watch. But you, you, you're really loyal to them and what they're doing with God and religion. You're not tied to anything broader. OK, and so and, and so you're, you're really just following one one fad after another. And I think people get to the point, look, I, I don't want the fad. I don't want the demagogue. I want something that is granite. I, I don't want McNuggets. You know, I, 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 I want I want the food that endures for eternal life. So I, I think that's one of the attractions. You're no longer tying yourself to what is popular what is edgy, what is cool, what is, you know, what, whatever is the flavor of the month, you're actually tethering your, your own faith to something that is enduring. It may not have the spiritual pyrotechnics. It may not have the biggest Twitter account, but it's something that is durable, okay? And it stood the test of time. Uh, and so that's why I think a, a lot of people are saying, I, I don't want the flimsy, the fad, the latest and the greatest. Um, I want something that's ancient, durable, and to see myself as a wider a part of something ancient. You know, the the, the communion of the of, of the saints, which is not just vertically, but it's diachronic and reaches it into the past. I think I think that's what I suspect is one of the attractions to these more liturgical, mainline, ancient churches, as opposed to the kind of, you know, pop evangelicalism, which is basically a non-denominational Baptistic church. Mm, yeah, yeah. And, and and if that describes your church. My sincerest apologies. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, yeah, well, we're, um, I would say, even from a Baptist context, I, I'm just very sympathetic to what you're saying, because we, we yeah, if it's kind of the, the flashy things and the, the, um, the transient things like that, that are drawing people, that's not healthy. But even, even in the Baptist tradition, it's been great to see some people trying to engage more in retrieval and greater historical depth, Catholicity, uh, those and people are valuing that th these days for good reasons. You know, those things are really important. But the main thing is we're going to talk about Bart Ehrman, and I've got these two books that are here on my desk, both of which came out in 2014. So one is Bart Ehrman's book, uh, How God Became Jesus, and then, or excuse me, this is the Ehrman book, How Jesus Became God. You would have corrected me on that, I'm sure. Just about to. <laughs> and then there's the response book that you contributed to. And I think we're, uh, did you put this one together or how did this book come to be? 
Oh, this book came together, I think it was about 2013. I was walking around the Society of Biblical Literature Conference and I saw this massive poster for Bart Ehrman's new book, you know, How Jesus Became God. And instantly my heart sank because I knew I was going to be imminently receiving emails from people all over the world, uh, confused, anxious about Ehrman's book and in particular about some of their friends who were starting, starting to read it. So, you know, that, that was one, that was the, I knew I was going to get these emails saying, what, what, what do I, what, is, is this correct? Is this true? I, I did not know this stuff. And, you know, er, Erman's very good. He, he's a good scholar, but he's also got a bit of showman in, in him. You know, he's kind of JB like, but with a bit of PT Barnum. And I, I say that as, as a kind of a compliment. And he's very good at beginning every chapter with, well, I used to be a stupid fundamentalist and I bought X, but now, but what have I told you? And it's that, what if I told you that really gets people in? And then he can bring in a little bit of mainline scholarship and popularize it, or he'll take something that's a little bit more um, of an outlier, but try and make it sound credible. And he does it very well. He, he writes very well at that level. So my heart sank and I thought, well, you know what? What if we could do like a response that was kind of done in real time? What if we could do something that, that came out kind of like, you know, concurrently, you know, around the same time? Uh, as, 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 this, as this book comes out, that, that, that would be terrific. So I spoke to Zondervan and we initially thought the idea of doing a short ebook uh, about, about Ehrman's book. And they said, no, we want, to do, we want to do a proper book. And we spoke to uh, Harper Collins and oh, Harper One, and they were very happy to give us, let us see the manuscript in advance. So uh, we, the, the team we put together, which is myself, Craig Evans, Chris Tilling, um, uh, Simon Gathercole, um, Charles Hill, I think that's it. Um, so we could we could write a response that came out at the same time. And this is a book that we um, began, wrote, and published within a hundred days, which apparently is like a Zondervan miracle. And Harper One did it mine because you know all, all presses is, is good press. And there was a very funny um, article in Publishers Weekly because Zondervan and Harper One are both owned by Harper Collins. And it's like Harper Collins has bet both ways on the deity of Jesus. So they kind of had Ehrman's book and ours. So it was a response to, to Ehrman's book with some, you know, very top rate, uh, I like to think evangelical scholars in the world you know, critically engaging him. Yeah. Uh, amazing that all, all of it done within 100 days. How, yeah. how, did, how did you manage that? Uh, well, we, we are, uh, good grief, I don't know. Uh, my, my editor, Kat, Katja uh, Kovret, would probably be um, uh, a better one to ask. Uh, well, we, you know, we, we got the people lined up with the contracts, like, you know, and, and these were top quality people like, you know, Craig Evans and Simon Gathercole and all that. Um, they signed up, said, yeah, sure, I'd love to be involved in this. And they only had to like write one chapter. And then it was just me kind of editing it and putting it together, re reading the original manuscript. So kind of over like Christmas 2013, I think is, you know, when most of us sort of uh, worked on this. And we had a very, very efficient editorial process, very quick um process of getting the book uh, done and dusted and it came out and it, it's it's done fairly well uh, there's some very fun reviews of the book by um bart ehrman acolytes on amazon uh, mm -hmm. but i find i find them more amusing than uh, than uh, concerning yeah 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 I, I was grateful for the book and in a second maybe i'll just ask you to give a brief overview of kind of what is the basic uh argument that ehrman is making in his book and but just to say why I'm great, because I I've known a lot of people who have lost their faith and it's been in connection to Airman scholarship, among other factors. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I understand a little bit if you go into it with a totally dismissive attitude and think, oh, Airman's not going to have anything good to say here. Um, you know, it, that can be disillusioning because at least my experience reading it is he makes you you know, you're on one page and you return the page and you're not very impressed then you get to a different page and you think oh i don't know how to respond to that, that that's a that's a yeah. you know, powerful point that he makes it but then over time and and going deeper i thought so like as an example when he's talking about john the claims for deity and jesus in john being really clear but not being in the earlier materials my first instinct was oh yeah maybe that's right but then i started going deeper and i realized i don't think that is right and so your book was helpful to me in my own process of working through his stuff. But anyway, give us a little overview. What's what's he saying in a nutshell? 
Okay. Oh, well, first of all, Urban is good. He doesn't come up with a view that Jesus was originally a human being and then he gradually evolved into God, which was an, like an older strand of scholarship. He says, no, basically pretty much at the resurrection, Christians believe Jesus was God. And and and, and this is the point where I think uh, Urban is correct. And he says, but in what sense did they believe that Jesus was divine? Because we tend to think that there's one God and there's all other reality. Whereas uh, in the ancient world, you could argue that there was something of a divine pyramid, you know, a kind of maybe a great God at the top, like a Zeus or a Jupiter or a Baal or something like that. And then you have these lesser divinities, um, other heavenly entities, powers, authorities. Then you have like angels. And then you have like human beings that somehow get uh, elevated into, into to divine honors. Like when the Roman emperors experience apotheosis or a type of deification or um, Hercules or Heracles, what you want to call him, kind of gets wafted up to heaven with this big flame. So in terms of ancient religion, he's correct. And you can say, well, in what sense do people think Jesus is divine? And then when he maps that across the New Testament and the early church, he says, well, in his mind, there seems to be two ways of being divine. One is the idea of a human being who's adopted to, 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 to divine status. And he thinks you can find traces of that in the opening of Romans and, and parts of Acts. And then he says the other view is a little bit later, beginning with, with Paul and then accented by John, where you have a pre-existent heavenly being who then becomes human and is then super exalted. And of course, when Ehrman reads Paul, he thinks that Paul believes Christ was an angel who became human and then gets elevated further within a heavenly hierarchy. The problem with these things I find is they're either saying something that's true or mostly true, or there's some sort of ingredient that's lacking. Okay, so that, that's the problem. He, he's saying stuff that is often kind of true and partly true. So let's take the example you gave, you know, the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, you do find a far heavier accent on the deity of Jesus, you know. You've got, you've got the prologue in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Now, I mean, there's a few translation issues, but generally most people say this is a pretty thick way of saying he's, he's God. And if you don't believe that, then you can go to the end of the gospel where Thomas says, my Lord and my God, which is pretty much of a slam dunk. And then you've got like, you know, before Abraham was, I am that type of thing. And then in chapter 10, you know, he makes himself equal with God. I am the father of one, the father in me and I am the father. These are all thick statements uh, that you don't find in the synoptic gospels matthew mark and luke so people say okay jesus is very divine in the gospel of john the synoptic gospels are not the same as the gospel of john therefore jesus is not divine in the synoptic gospels that seems to be the type of argument but what i push back on and say well no you've got jesus described as divine but simply using uh, different language, different imagery, different devices. Now, John is drawing on a slightly different tradition. He's got a, a, his tradition, I think, is both, you know, genuine memories of the historical Jesus, but also a very thick interpretive layer. layer. He's not just telling, uh, saying, look, if you follow Jesus with a camcorder or you know, with an iPad, we should say these days and record it, this is what you would have seen. It's more like a documentary dr drama, okay? A, dr a dramatic reenactment that has its own, his, like historical root, but also an interpretive aspect because John's interested not just in who Jesus was, but who he is and continues to be. Now with the synoptic gospels, uh, they're making some very strong, cl strong claims that Jesus is divine as well, but they're not doing it in the way that John does, which doesn't mean he's not divine. They're just doing it in a different way. You know, the fact that Matthew has in his uh, infancy narrative, you know, that Jesus will be called Emmanuel, God with us, is, is a pretty good clue. And at the end of the book, he has all authority on heaven and earth. Well, normally you think God has all authority on heaven and earth. Now, Jesus seems to embody that. And in particular, I like to go through the Gospel of Mark, which people think is, you know, a low Christology book, and far from it. You know, you, you, you go, you know, John the Baptist says, I'm here to prepare the way of the Lord. And the guy who turns up next is Jesus. So the preparing the way of the Lord from Isaiah is preparing the way for Jesus, which is, you know, a, a pretty good way uh, of, of insinuating that Jesus is a divine figure. And, you know, we, we see in chapter two, who who has the authority to forgive sins, but God alone. I mean, that language, God alone, the one God, this is monotheistic rhetoric, you know, God is one, only one God, you know, uh, and yet it is Jesus who has that authority. 
Um, he also has, uh, his walking on the water has a theophanic quality, similar to describe God in some of the Psalms. And then in chapter 10, what I find very, very interesting, um, um, you have this, you know, Jesus repeats the, the, the Shema, you know, um, here he is rather Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then in, oh, maybe that's chapter 12, sorry. And then in ch chapter 12, he quotes Psalm 110, uh, implying that he kind of shares in the throne with Israel's God, which is then accented uh, in, in uh, chapter 14, verses 62, where Caiaphas asked Jesus if you are uh, the, the Messiah. And Jesus responds by splicing together Daniel 7, 13 and Psalm 110, which both refer to a figure co-enthroned beside God. Jesus says, I am basically Yahweh's vice regent, not on my own miniature throne next to Yahweh or around. I sit next to Yahweh on his very own throne. Jesus shares in the orbit of divine sovereignty. Okay, so that may not be the same as, you know, what John is saying, you know, like before Abraham was born, I am all my Lord and my God, but Mark, and I think Matthew and Luke are all declaring Jesus is God, but they're doing it in a very Jewish way. And they're not, just because they don't use the same explicit language and grammar and discourse as John, doesn't mean that their Christology is any lesser or any lower than, than John's. Yes. And by the way, before I forget, I will put a uh, link to your to this book that we're talking about uh, in the video description so people watching this can check it out and, and purchase it. But I just to circle back on the things you're saying here, I found it really helpful. Uh, at one point you say, even in John's gospel, Jesus doesn't exactly walk around just saying, hey, God is a trinity and I'm number two. Uh, yeah. The statements of divinity come in a particular context of conflict with the Pharisees. And you, you talk about in Mark's gospel, the same thing. There's this escalating conflict with the Jewish leaders all throughout. And even there at Mark 2, um, when Jesus forgives sins, Ehrman is saying, oh, Jesus is just telling the man that God has forgiven him. But as you point out, the Pharisees respond by saying, this is blasphemy, you know. So do you think the, um, and then let me just read the verse that, that you uh, referenced in John 14, or in Mark 14 the uh, high priest says, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? Jesus responds, I am, and you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. That's Mark 14, 61 and 62. So do you think the, the response, and then uh, Caiaphas, I think it is, tears his clothes at this. Yeah, exactly. So the response of the Jewish leaders, do you think this is another indication of how Jesus's words were understood in that context? Yeah, definitely. Uh, if Jesus was not saying anything controversial or was thought to compromise or infringe monotheism, you know, the, the belief and the worship of only one God, then, you know, uh, no one would have objected. If Jesus simply said, well, God forgives your sins, people would have said, like, got no problem with that. Mm -hmm. But when Jesus says, I'm kind of doing it on my authority. And, and, and importantly, in that thing, Jesus isn't claiming to be a rogue priest, like, you know, as he's like going around, you know, um, renewing people's driver's license, you know, apart from the you know, DMV. Uh, no, he, he's claiming a kind of divine authority to, to forgive sins, which is normally the prerogative of, of God. The priest did not mention the forgiveness of sins in the sacrifice in the Jerusalem cultus down in the temple, as, as far as we know. Uh, so he, he's doing something that that does have overtones of divine authority and that that language, you know, but, but who can do this but God alone? OK, this is this is monotheistic language. And that is why the uh, the, the Pharisees uh, get affronted by Jesus's action. Yes. Let's talk about Ehrman's idea that the line between divine and human was more blurry in the ancient world, because it seems, as you mentioned, that that's a significant part of his case that you've got, you know, human beings becoming gods and and uh, there wasn't as thick or clear a distinction between human and divine in the ancient world one of the things that is often pointed out and you get into this in chapter two of the book is that in jewish thought there was a clear distinction and i'll just quote here and then ask you maybe to unpack this a little bit you said um, a sharp line was drawn between the veneration of intermediary figures and the worship of the one god based on the fact that such beings were not part of God's divine identity. Yep. So could you unpack a little bit further that, you know, this idea of a, a clear distinction between divine and that which is not God in first century Jewish thought? 
Yep. Okay. Now here's just one of those elements where Ehrman is partly right. Okay. That there is a kind of heavenly hierarchy, certainly in the you know, Greek and Roman religion, and even the Jewish world, you've got God. You might say there are angels and there are the sort of you know celestial powers and, and, and that sort of things. And we do have stories of like um, like Enoch being translated into heaven and, and, and that kind of a thing. But the problem is that generally, I have to say generally, you might find one or two exceptions. Generally, the Jews believed that God was distinct as the creator. And they seem to divide things into these two categories. There is God and there is other reality. And generally, they would worship the one God. Uh, angels could be invoked in prayers. You know, you can find all sorts of mention of angels. And you, you could talk about a type of veneration of angels. But I don't think people are worship the J Jews are generally worshipping angels in the same way that they are worshipping Yahweh, God of creation and covenant. And uh, pe people debate about what, well, you know, was was were the Jews really monotheists uh, or were they really kind of, you know, um, monotheists in an absolute, okay, there's only one divine being and there's nothing else. I mean, that's not what the, the Jews meant by monotheism. They, they had their own heavenly hierarchy of angels and archangels. And that's why I, I prefer to talk about monarchical monotheism. You know, God is God over this sort of this heavenly world, but even that world is created by him. OK, and, and that's what what people uh, seem to forget. And one of the places where this comes out very clear and crisp for my mind is if you read uh, the Jewish philosopher Philo, his his critique of Caligula's deification. You know, he goes around uh, acting and talking as if he thinks he's Mars. You know, he demands divine worship. He wanted to put a statue of himself in the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem. And if you read Philo's critique of uh, Caligula, you know, Ga Gaius Caligula, you see ve a very strong emphasis. There is God and there is not God. And Caligula, you most definitely belong in the not God category. OK, so, I mean, if, if you if you read something like um, Philo's critique of Caligula's, you know, uh, pretense to divine status and honors, uh, you, you clearly see that 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 crisp, clear um, uh, difference. And so I, I think the creator creature distinction is paramount in Jewish thought. And I would say generally and this and people will dispute this, but I think cultic worship, like the type of worship you get in the temple, you only offer to Yahweh. You don't worship an angel. You don't worship Baal. You don't worship Zeus. You don't worship Jupiter. Uh, the, 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 the Jews would not worship the imperial family. They would not worship the emperor. They would allow the off the emperor to make an offering in their temple every day. This was this was like the compromise deal. Okay, you don't have to worship the Roman gods or venerate the emperor, but you have to accept a sacrifice from the emperor in your in their temple. That's how strict they were in their concern to 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 maintain that distinction between the one God. And, and the wider array of deities that were that were venerating the ancient world. Mm. You, you quote Martin Hengel at one point talking about how early on in the first century a high Christology can be seen. And he said more happened in the period of less than two decades. I think that's between the resurrection and Paul's epistles. Yep. So like the 30s to the 50s, kind of that time. Then in the whole next seven centuries, up to the time when the doctrine of the early church was completed. Could you unpack a little bit about um, what's the evidence for this high Christology so early on? Well, I think it's it's a number of things you've got going on. Okay, so after the, the resurrection, where they've experienced, you know, the risen Jesus in their midst, seeing him, touching him, being a, a, his ascension to heaven, which, you know, I think for them was a mixture of of visual marvel, mystery, and metaphor, all these things kind of rolled into one. And they now know that he has a, uh, a an intense identification with the God of Israel, okay? And they use the language of Psalm 110 uh, to make sense of it, okay? That's how he, he so he's, he, he, Jesus is not the father. They don't know, and they don't seem to be saying that, but he is now a divine person. But the question is, in what sense? Is he kind of like a miniature God? Well, that would kind of compromise monotheism if you have like a, a second god. Uh, was he an archangel? Oh, no, didn't quite give that impression. So that they're trying to find a way, and, and, and they don't have the exact grammar yet, and it takes about 400 years to really figure it out. 
but what they do believe is that is that Jesus seems to be part of that divine identity in the sense of sharing in that creator crea uh, creature distinction, and he is also worthy of worship. That's what their memory of Jesus and their experience of the risen Jesus leads them to believe. Now, they're not using theological categories like homoousios. They're not talking about, you know, um, you know, uh, one God, one power, one eternity, and three separate persons, you know, that type of thing. So we've got to be careful not to expect or to read back into it the precision of the later creeds or theological categories. But they do believe that Jesus is strongly identified with the God of Israel, and they begin to talk that way. OK, and one of the most amazing things you see automatically is 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 the way Paul talks about God, the father uh, in the opening and closing of his letters. OK, you know, grace to you from God, our father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, when they think of what is what is the analog, what is the natural comparative partner between God? Uh, they think of Jesus. Je the natural partner is with Jesus. They think, you know, Jesus and his angels. They don't think about Jesus and the exalted Moses or the exalted Enoch. The most natural analog um, for who Jesus is as a divine person is God the Father. So they're thinking of Jesus as divine, probably in the sense of God the Father himself. Okay, so that's, that's one thing you see. And the early Christians, when they mentioned God the Father, they felt the need to mention Jesus. And when they mentioned Jesus, they could only do it by mentioning God the Father. This is what Larry Hurtado calls the sort of binatarian sense of thought of early Christianity. And then you can look at some really key texts and to see what Christians are doing. I mean, they're talking about Jesus as being the Messiah for one, but they're also then using uh, the, the language of, of Yahweh, of, of the one God of Israel from the Old Testament and applying it to Jesus. You see, you see this in a few ways. In uh, Philippians 2, you know, at the end of it, they describe Jesus, you know, being in the form of God, having equality with God. Again, we can haggle over a few phrases and what they mean. But by the end of it, they're using the language of Isaiah 45, verse 23, to describe who Jesus is, you know. And the one God who shares his glory with no other says, and I now share that glory with the exalted Jesus. So this, this, this is an amazing claim. Or if you go to 1 Corinthians 8, where Paul quotes the Shema, you know, uh, here is Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And Paul says, you know, for us, there is one God, the Father, and one Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he takes that basic monotheistic cre uh, creed of ancient Israel, and he puts Jesus bang smack in the middle of it next to God the Father. So in, in, in a very strong relational sense, you know, for Israel, there is one God. There is for Israel one Lord. And now when they say that, they say it in relation to God the Father and Jesus. And if we wanted to go back even earlier than that, you know, Paul gives a little um, hint of, of, of the, the Aramaic speaking church and what they were saying about Jesus in, in 1 Corinthians 16, 22, when he says, you know, Maranatha, our Lord come, you know, the, the word Aramaic word Mara means, you know, means Lord. Okay, now it can have a few different possible meanings, but again, it seems to be identifying Jesus very strongly in the sense of the sovereignty of the one God. And I, look, I could go one day and talk about how they see Jesus's role with the Father in creation. He, he himself is not created. Um, he seems to be uh, working in tandem with the Father to be the instrument through which creation has come into being. And this all adds up together to say, although we don't have the terminology, the complexity, and all the debates of later centuries, we have some of the DNA for both the later debates, different things you can emphasize, but certainly the basis for a divine Christology. Mm, that's really good. So uh, pulling back from this and thinking in terms of kind of apologetics and just uh, engaging from this with our friends who maybe are, are skeptical or questioning some of these claims, do you think we can still make the old appeal from C.S. Lewis of Lord, liar, lunatic, and I've heard some people say that when we're wanting to factor in the concerns of airmen and others, we can, we just need to add on a fourth option and that's uh, Lord, liar, lunatic or legend. But if we yeah. can cross off the legend category as implaus as less plausible than, than Lord, and we can also cross off the liar or lunatic options, that argument can still work. What do yeah. you think about that? Do you think Lewis's argument can still be put to good use? 
Um, yeah, in one sense. I mean, in, in Ammon's defense, I don't think he would call Jesus legend. I mean, he wrote a book saying the historical Jesus was real, right. and he uh, got stripped of, stripped of an award from the American Humanistic Association for saying Jesus existed. Um, but that's that could be a whole other podcast on that. Uh, well, I mean, the, the, one of the issues is the title Lord can be used in different ways. Okay, so if you read the book of Acts, angels can get called Lord. Okay, so they they're... they're <laughs> If you know the, te the, the technical details of New Testament and angels and early Christianity, there are one or two problems there. But if you mean Lord in the sense, is Jesus God? Is he the God man? Okay. And this is, this is the challenge we're pre presented with uh, as we read the New Testament. I mean, the New Testament drives to answer this question, who is Jesus? And in fact, that is the most important question you can ask, and that is behind uh, C.S. Lewis's famous trilemma or quadrilemma, whatever you want to do with it. The question of who is Jesus is paramount. And I think you can say Jesus really is the incarnate God. He is God made flesh. That is, I believe, something that is still an option, despite all the critics, despite the skeptics, despite all the various other options that are on the table. I still find that to be a credible claim. It seems to be what the earliest generations of Christians believe and what has been transmitted and continued on to this very day. So I think confessing of Jesus Lord uh, is something that was true for the early Christians. It was true in subsequent centuries. And as someone who's tried to live that out in their own life, living under the Lordship of Jesus, it remains true for billions of people today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And thank you for clarifying that it, with the, the legend term with, so that, cause I don't want to misrepresent Airman. He's very clear. Jesus existed. Um, mm. but the legend claim would be with respect to the, that he claimed the historical Jesus claimed to be God. That those oh, yep. claims would be yep. legendary in the sense they don't go back to him. That'd be Airman's oh, yep. perspective, but sure um, yeah. Okay. That's helpful. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure you have people who email you or interact with you or talk to you who say, Hey, I'm struggling with these things. Uh, I I've, I thought the case was clearer uh, then, and now I'm wading into, I'm reading Bart Ehrman or I'm reading somebody else and I'm kind of wrestling with uh how, how do I make sense of this? What advice do you give someone when they're wrestling with this question? Or how can I really be sure that that the Jesus I believe in as a Christian really does relate authentically to the actual yep. Jesus of history? Yeah, and that's 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 a very that's a very good question. Is, is the the Jesus who I have been led to believe is that really who Jesus uh, was uh, in that question? And yeah, I mean, I, I think you have to, you simply have to look at, you know, the evidence now, like I said, not everything that Ehrman says is incorrect. Uh, he says a great deal of stuff that's true. He gives some very good summaries of, you know, uh, the nature of divinity in the ancient world. He gives sort of some mainstream and some minority reports in biblical studies and the, the poor lay person reading this. Uh, is not equipped with the tools or the knowledge of scholarship or the primary sources to know which is widely accepted and which is uh, a little, being a little bit of um, sensationalist um, or deliberately provocative in what Ehrman says. So the, the antidote to that is to read widely, okay? So if you're reading like you know, Bart Ehrman and you're a little bit concerned, well, wow, this, this, does this mean the whole thing is a bit of a, a bit of a, a um, uh, not just a, a mystery, but but a bit of a, a bit of a, um, a a joke or something that's been made up and manufactured. Okay, uh, then go read something else. And there's there's a lot of books written on on Christology you could read. Um, there's some great stuff by Larry Hurtado, Richard Balcom, uh, Chris Tilling. Uh, these are these are the type of people I habitually refer to. And you'll realize that although Ehrman makes some good points, he's not the only show playing in town. And there's plenty of reasons for saying yes, but, and oh, well, good grief, man, no, all the way through to come on, you can't be serious. Um, you, you have all those three levels of responses, which I think we largely make in, in our own book. And it's try, try, trying to push back and saying there's a different way of telling the story of how the early church regarded Jesus as a divine person. Mm -hmm. Okay, so give me two or three books. So I think we've mentioned, Simon, you mentioned Simon Gathercole, you mentioned Larry Hurtado. Um, give me maybe two or three books, and I'll put those in the video description that you'd recommend to someone if they're yep. wanting a counter perspective to Airmen. 
Yep. Well, I mean, look, there's a stack of books by these scholars. When it comes to Larry Hurtado, now, now blessed memory, sadly, um, he, did, he did a good little book called Honoring the Sun, published by Lexham Press. And, and that is a kind of good short summary of a lifetime of work by him. Because Larry points out the real key way to know if someone is divine or not is through the category of worship. He says, you know, forget, forget the titles, forget all the parallelisms between Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls. And he says, you know, that's all fine. But if you, the real litmus test for divinity is worship and patterns of devotion. And he says, very quickly, you see Jesus being worshipped by the early church, not as an angel, not as an exalted patriarch, but as, as the God of Israel. And then you've got Richard uh, Balcom, his book called Jesus and the God of Israel. And he's very big on this category of the, you know, the creator creature distinction. And he thinks that, that is paramount. And, and Jesus is being identified with God, not in the sense of uh, having the divine substance or a divine um, ontology or anything. But he says, Jesus is part of the divine identity. He shares in the divine name, and he is part of that creator creature distinction. Now, I, I'd have my own little um, footnotes I would change or move around with both scholars, but I think they're both very good contributions and they're very good alternatives to uh, what Ehrman was uh, putting forth. And lastly, I'd probably put forward Chris Tilling's book, uh, which is Paul's Divine Christology. I think that's a very good, very underrated book, very underrated book. And Chris Tilling, I think, is the next generation of scholars of Paul with a big interest in Christology. And yeah, but I think between those three are really where I would go to if you want to say, okay, Ehrman's is interesting, but I reckon there might be another side to this. That's who I would recommend, those three scholars, Hurtado, Balcom, and Tilling. Wonderful. Thank you. I'll put those in the video description. And um, yeah, Mike, thank you. It's great to interact with you. I'm grateful for your work. Where can people go to find out, to learn more about you? Uh, you can find me, uh, pro you can probably find out what I'm thinking, doing, and reading uh, through Twitter at ember12. I have a blog called um, Euangelion, and I spasmatic, spasmodically put stuff on a little YouTube channel, which I think I've called to advance the gospel. So if, if you're um, interested in knowing what I'm doing, or we just want to keep your disgust fresh, uh, th that'd be the place to, to see what I'm up to on, on, a, on, a, on a daily or weekly basis. Mm -hmm.